All right, y'all. So um, this lab is the first of four-step multi-step multi-step synthesis. So it's going to be on the macro scale. Most of the stuff we've been doing is on the micro scale. So preparation of benzoin by a thiamine catalyst, right? A catalysis. Um, so we're taking two units of benzaldehyde, hitting it with the thiamine catalyst, and then we're making benzoin. So um, this is actually really cool because thiamine is a B vitamin, right? And so as we know, vitamins are essential, right? And that's basically because they're coenzymes in our body. So thiamine, for example, binds to an enzyme and that enzyme binds to a substrate and a reaction occurs within the body. And so if you don't have B vitamins, then you get really sick. And um, that's why, I mean, I'm pretty sure <laughs> I've read this somewhere, but that's why they fortify rice, for example, or other grains with B vitamins because they're cheaper foods. And so if you are only eating those cheaper foods, then you're not getting essential vitamins and then you can uh, be malnourished and then uh, it's all bad from that, right? And so there's B vitamins in everything now. It'd be really, I think, at least in the US, it'd be really hard to be deficient in B vitamins. Um, but of course, very very important that we can kind of maintain that or check that uh long story short <clears throat> basically thiamine um is the active component of that that biological catalytic reaction um now the enzyme or the is not necessarily required but it helps regulate the um the thermodynamics and kinetics of a given reaction stereochemistry as well and so as we know our body does perform chemical reactions extremely efficiently and uh with st perfect uh enantio uh selectivity right so we can form only one enantiomer when we do our chemical reactions within our body and so uh obviously chemists aspire to be as efficient as the body but um it's <laughs> that's hard um and so basically thiamine can be used in the lab just like it is used in our body um and this is a really good example it's actually a super cool mechanism and so i'm excited to show you this it is a lot there's a lot of drawing i'm going to simplify it the best i can um but so what i've done here is i've shown you thiamine hydrochloride right? That's our catalyst. <clears throat> um, of course, with a little bit of base, right? And the blue portion is the active site of the thiamine, okay? So that is called, that portion right there is called, it's a heterocyclic ring, right? We have a nitrogen and a sulfur within a ring, and a, a heterocycle is a, a ring with uh, atoms other than like carbon and hydrogen, right? So, um, <clears throat> This particular ring right here, um, that hydrogen that I have explicitly drawn is particularly acidic. And the reason why it's acidic is because it's stabilized um, via resonance and it forms an illid. And so that's pretty much the direction that we're going with this mechanism. So the mechanism, I'm going to short, like shorten it, I guess just simplify it by omitting the portions of that thiamine HCl in black. So the the OH group and then the other heterocycle to the left, those are going to be emitted and just kind of written as R groups, okay? Just to simplify it further because, again, the only portion of this thiamine hydrochloride that we care about is the blue ring, okay? So let's take a look at that. All right, so let's take a look. See... Um, again, I don't know what it is, but drawing heterocycles is like, I'm so bad at it. I need, I've had totally enough practice, but something about making the ring with another atom in there. But <clears throat> remember this, this proton right here is particularly acidic because it is, um, stabilized. All right. So sodium hydroxide is the base that we're using and, we're going to go ahead and place that lone pair from that CH bond on the carbon. 
All right, sorry, let me just divide this up. We got our mechanism right here, of course. That's, we all know what we're doing. We're just gonna line it up though. Okay, so that puts the lone pair on the carbon. We got the positive charge on the nitrogen. So we got a negative charge on the carbon, which makes it an elid, an elid, an elid, an elid, an elid, an elid. Don't you compare me because there ain't nobody near me. They don't see me, but they hear me. They don't feel me, but they feel me. Which y'all know about Little Wayne. <laughs> oh my God, that song is totally inappropriate. But if you know it, you already knew it, right? So I didn't do nothing. Um, anyway. Fantastic song if you're down for that. Um, plus that album cover. Are you serious right now? What is that on like the Carter four or something? I don't remember. Let me know. Carter three probably. Uh, anyway, that positive next to that negative charge, of course, is an illid and it is resonance stabilized. So we can put that lone pair basically the two carbon two electrons in that nitrogen carbon double bond on the nitrogen and that puts a lone pair on the carbon and that new nitrogen is neutral they're actually all neutral that carbon is actually electron deficient because it doesn't have an octet but it's still neutral so this guy's actually kind of fancy right um it look at that like there that's called a carbene okay so um carbene right i don't know why i put the quotes i started to put quotes there but it's, it's just a carbene it's not quote unquote carbene it's just a carbene um and this is i mean heterocycles like this are actually super pretty common um the most common one in like organic chemistry for example that i actually did do research with was the n heterocyclic carbene the nhc and it looked like this generally with two r groups on there um Bob Grubbs and uh, Schrock won the Nobel Prize using this type of chemistry in uh, 2005, probably. I think it was 2005. Uh, either way, solid chemistry, pretty cool compound. Um, and yeah, so we're working with the carbene right now. It's an electron deficient uh, carbon right there with a, just straight a lone pair on there. It's all neutral and stuff. What are you talking about? I had to get rid of that. Uh, baby Lil Wayne right there because I feel like it might be distracting but also I gotta throw a benzaldehyde right here okay so remember the pH represents a benzene ring um, so that lone pair on the the illid attacks the carbonyl carbon because that is most susceptible to nucleophilic attack right we know that and so kick that lone pair onto the oxygen that puts a negative charge on that oxygen right <clears throat> and Sorry, I gotta gather myself when I draw this thing over and over and over and over again. So bear with me. Uh, I'll try and move quicker. We've got our groups, y'all. We got them. All right, so everything looks good. We got that bond now with the carbonyl carbon and the alkyl oxide, right? So what do we want to do? Anytime we're drawing a mechanism, we want to try and neutralize our charges. Okay, so the next thing would be protonate that guy, right? Um, so now we've got the alcohol there. Um, here, sorry, it's going to take a minute to redraw everything, but what we've got is, all right, double check, make sure the bond connectivities are good. Okay. And so now what we want to do is move this over so we have more room to, for the next step. We hit it with another equivalent of hydroxide to grab that acidic proton here. Um, and that pushes the electrons onto the nitrogen. Remember, this is resonance stabilized, right? So that is that proton is actually pretty easy to grab, and um, and it also kind of moves the reaction forward to allow us to form the desired product. So we've got our lone pair on the nitrogen now. That created a double bond between the carbon and the ring structure, uh, looking like this, and. Um, so now this sets us up for the next step, which would be to react with another equivalent of benzaldehyde. So again, at the carbonyl carbon, we attack that after pushing the pi electrons around, and that forms another alkoxide. So let's go ahead and redraw this ring system again. Told you this was going to be tedious, but it's just something we got to do. Um, 
the whole ring is actually, well, not the whole ring, but a, the large part of that ring structure is used within this mechanism, so it's important to draw out the, the entire ring. Okay, so we've got the alk oxide. What do you think is next? Of course, to protonate with water. And then, I'm going to try and copy this so I don't have to redraw it. I'm cheating. Oh, you're trying to take shortcuts, and this, hap this is what happens. Don't take shortcuts, y'all. This <laughs> it's, the struggle is real. All right, so erase this little portion, hit it with the little hydrogen. All right, so that doesn't look anything like our desired product, right? But it's close. So remember, our desired product actually had a carbonyl and an alcohol, right? So <clears throat> what we can do is... Wait, let's take a look at it real quick. It's not right here. Okay, right here. So benzoin, notice, has the carbonyl adjacent to that alcohol. So what we need to do is create a carbon-oxygen double bond. And we can do that by deep removing that proton with hydroxide, creating that carbon-oxygen double bond. And then it actually breaks the carbon-carbon bond between that heterocycle and the, the product, right? And so we reformed our ILID hence being called a catalyst because the definition of a catalyst is to get the reaction popping and also reforming it so that it can be used again. So it's added in sub stoichiometric amounts, right? We know the definition of a catalyst because we've used one before. Um, but we also have our benzoin product, right? So I can actually turn this sideways for you. And yeah, I mean, the pH, the phenyl groups are sideways, but you can see that that now looks like the desired product, okay? All right, so you're probably like, what just happened? We made that benzoin, but like, how? Don't worry, I'll feed you baby birds. Let me just sum it up for you real quick. Okay, so um, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's great is the, the mechanism, right? So we hit it with benzaldehyde. Oh, my God. Smells so good. I'm sorry. Uh, a little thiamine, a little B vitamins, right? All you got to do is just have your bear claws, y'all, and you can do chemistry. Thiamine with your hydroxide forms your ilid catalyst, right? And you take your, basically, your ilid catalyst and your benzaldehyde together make your benzoin desired product, right? And since that ilid catalyst is in fact a catalyst. It just, it's like, boom, 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 it just keeps producing the product. A little bit of illid catalyst, a little bit of benzaldehyde, and then bada bing, bada boom, you got benzoin for days. All right, all right. So that's uh, pretty much it. Let me know if you have any questions. Let's check out the lab now, though. Okay, so here we go. Um, this lab, uh, we're doing one of two different types of procedures, okay? So right now what I'm gonna do is I am going to mix together three grams of, uh, yeah, this will, fine. this will be fine. Three grams of thiamine HCl, so thiamine hydrochloride. So as you know, this is thermally uh, unstable, I guess. So it's it decomposes in the presence of heat. And so I got that out of the fridge. It is a wee bit old. It has a date on it. We, we got it. We opened it actually in 2018. So um, keep that in mind if things don't work out, right? So, sorry, get a little paper towel. Um, and it is three grams. So I probably should have gotten a different thing to dispense it but y'all gonna watch me struggle nope i'm gonna scoop it because that's how i'm gonna do let's see can i get can i get crafty y'all are gonna see when i like i do the weird things to like cut corners and it doesn't work out for me ever so i'm gonna do this i could just go get a funnel i should go get a funnel y'all should just tell me just go get a funnel jess just go get a funnel okay Here's my funnel, y'all. What's up? Okay, so, I mean, it should be clean. 
and it is. So let's go ahead. See, check this out. This is so much easier. Why do I do this to myself all the time? Look, I could have just, or why do I almost do this? Boom. Here is three grams. It's actually 3.025 grams of thiamine hydrochloride. And yeah. Okay, so tiny bit, probably can't see on the way paper, of course, it's gonna happen, right? So I'll give it a little tap, tap, tap a -roo. get that in there. Sometimes you can also take your spatula and just like stab, stab, stab. You can see it kind of falling through, however you wanna do it. Sometimes the white powder or solid can be particularly staticky and will stick to whatever you're working with. And so you wanna minimize uh, the contact with like a variety like this guy right here so maybe I want to tap it in instead because then after that what I can do is add five mils of water and instead of just adding it straight to this flask this Erlenmeyer flask what I could do to get it off of the funnel is give it a little ooh, check that out rinse it right you gotta do what you gotta do to get all the goodness Give that a little swirl and so it feels cool right now i'm not sure if that was the water or sometimes when you mix things together they do actually cool um when we actually when we add sodium hydroxide to things or like acid remember that's an exothermic process and so typically those heat up so when we add the sodium hydroxide in a little bit we want to be make sure that we add it very slowly so that way it doesn't actually heat up because again thermal decomposition of the thiamine hydrochloride is definitely undesired. Okay, so now we got everything, nice, beautiful solution. And the next step is going to be um, adding 30 mils of 95% uh, ethanol. I don't think we have 95% ethanol. Um, so I'm gonna use this guy right here. It's ethanol, right, who cares? So I also, Oof, fresh bottle y'all um i'm gonna eyeball this it's it's solvent right so it's not the end of the world if we get it a little off that's kind of way off though um it's solvent again though so let's see that's about 20 23 24 25 26 that's about 26 and a half mils so again i'm rinsing 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 I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more. 26 and a half. I'm pouring. All right, we got some, we got some liquids in there. Okay, so give a little swirl. Homogeneous solution is what we're looking for. Um, now here comes the step where we add sodium hydroxide. So I prepared a solution of sodium hydroxide um, right before this video. So the importance of having, um, well, basically anytime you store sodium hydroxide, it can react with the carbon dioxide in the air, right? And so you're forming, uh, it, when hydroxide reacts with a, CO2, it forms a carbonate ion, right? Or bicarbonate ion. And so we don't want that. We want straight up hydroxide up in there. And so that's why I made it fresh, okay? Here's another thing. Um, remember, I just said that it's an exothermic process. So uh, we wanna make sure that we're adding this 10 milliliter solution containing 0 0.865 grams of sodium hydroxide very slowly, okay? And I'm also gonna keep my hands around it uh, to make sure, actually it's not quite dissolved, but I'm gonna keep my hands around it so that any heat that does form can actually, it'll, it'll transfer to my hands. So another way we could do this is do it in an ice bath. Um, <laughs> but what I tell you, sometimes I like to do things the hard way. It's just, I'm silly, I'm silly. Okay, so. would have helped in uh, getting these, this guy dissolved. 5% water, 
and then 30 mils. Let's see, 10% is three, right? So we want like a mil of water. Should we do that? Let's do it and see what happens. DI water straight from the sink. <laughs> um, swirly, swirly, swirl. Okay, here's the thing. Whenever, this is actually a great opportunity to discuss this. So whenever you have a heterogeneous mixture, right? So we've got solid material, we've got liquid or material dissolved in the liquid. Um, what's gonna react first? The stuff that's dissolved in the liquid, right? And so technically when we add our sodium hydroxide we're adding it to a um a less concentrated uh solution of our hydro uh, sorry thiamine hydrochloride thiamine steel and so this in theory should have an effect on how it interacts and so we just want to make sure that we're aware of that and how concentration can play a role uh, when we're adding chemicals together and what we're going to do though is still do it uh Basically, what's going to happen is, well, let's just observe what happens, okay? So, again, I'm just going to go ahead and add this dropwise, okay? So, what that means is drop, a little swirly swirl. Okay, let me set this down because I don't want to hold both of those. And for whatever reason, is anybody else just terrible at swirling things with their left hand? Ooh. So what can you observe is, is happening. What is happening? Ooh. Can you see that? Maybe not. Oh, maybe, maybe not. Let's see. I'll try and not swirl it when I add it. That way you can actually see what's happening. You see it? Ooh, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Okay, so basically we want to uh, add the sodium hydroxide and swirl the flask until that super cool yellow fades to more like a pale yellow, okay? And so I also want to make sure that I feel this as I'm swirling. Remember I told you I was going to be doing it so that the heat transfers to my hand. Maybe I'll do it like this because I can swirl much better with my right hand. But I also can't pipette very well with my left hand. The struggle is really all. I could put this on a hot plate and have it stirring. But like I said, I want this around my hand uh, because I want to have to make sure that it stays coolish, like at least room temperature. Um, again, you could put it on a hot plate on an ice bath, and that would be totally fine. I don't want to walk down the hall and grab ice from the ice machine. That's real talk. That's why I don't want to do this. It's also not in the procedure. So I'm telling you that you can do that to like better the procedure and like super duper ensure that it's not going to thermally decompose but it's also not necessarily required. So as you can see, I still have a lot of liquid in my pipette because I am adding this ever so slowly because I really do care about this. And this thiamine hydrochloride needs to be present in order for the reaction to proceed, okay? Oh, I'm getting it like all up in the pipette. All right, now, I don't think you need to watch me do this forever. So I'm gonna go ahead and just show you the final results, okay? Ah. All right, so we're adding the last little bit. I actually am adding a total of nine mils of the base. Did I, I might have said 10, I meant nine. I made 10 mils of the solution but then I am only adding nine. Okay, okay, okay. So now what we're doing, swirling this until that 
beautiful bright color goes away to a pale yellow okay and then it's not warm at all so that's good that's good that's good now what I want to do is add the benzaldehyde so what we're gonna do is add 10 mils of benzaldehyde but what we're gonna do is actually weigh it so I'm gonna weigh this real quick and then I'm gonna weigh it after the addition of benzaldehyde. That way we know exactly how much aldehyde we added. Uh, since we're using the mass, we're gonna to have to use the density. Um, well, no, I guess it doesn't matter. We'll have the mass of benzaldehyde. We don't have to do anything um, other than record the mass and then use that for our calculation. So that's sweet for you guys. And let's go, let's check it out. Oh, so while I was kind of getting ready for that benzaldehyde situation, I was realizing I never really completed my thought on the like reactivity of things that are like in a heterogeneous mixture. So um, the reason why that's important also is because if the solid is not in solution, then it's not reacting, right? So if you actually had that solid persisting throughout, let's say the reaction called for a 90 minute reflux, right? And if you had that solid persisting throughout the whole 90 minutes, then it's not reacting, right? Uh, and we saw this in another reaction where um, I was a little concerned about the product, but the, the other thing that you gotta be careful with is sometimes the precipitate might form during a reaction, right? And if you have this product dissolving and then reacting to form new product that's precipitating out, then it might be a little difficult to kind of determine if that solid did actually dissolve, but um, sometimes the, the, the look of the solid could be helpful. Is it like sand or is it like uh, really fine powder, like powdered sugar, for example, um, or somewhere in between, or maybe even the color would be helpful. But uh, the point is that if it's not in solution, then it's not reacting in theory. Okay, at least definitely not at the same rate as it would be in solution. And so if anything, that 90 minute reflux didn't allow your reaction to go to completion because of the formation of that, or because of the presence of that solid material, uh, rather than everything being in solution with it as a homogeneous mixture, okay? Uh, all right, so let's check out the mass of our thiamine HCl solution. Okay, so I got my nine mils of benzaldehyde here. I have the bottle. Uh, it says 99% plus, right? And we've got harmful if swallowed, right? Oh, that's a bummer because you know benzaldehyde be all up in my uh, bear claws, right? Just kidding. It's an almond paste, right? And they don't put it in there. It's just naturally occurring. So it's a super small amount. Oh my goodness, that smells so good. Well, you might be wondering, okay, Benzalda has a liquid, right? What's this solid material right here? It looks kind of gorgeous. Like, a little flaky, gorgy, little crystals. Um, so, Benzaldehyde, in the presence of oxygen, can get oxidized to carboxylic acid. And so, what that means is some of this Benzaldehyde might not be very good. Uh, which could prevent the reaction from moving forward, at least to the extent that we want it. And so this is something to think about um, as like a, a source of error, right? Um, another thing I want to talk about is if this benzaldehyde, so this is a fresh bottle I just opened, but I mean, clearly benzaldehyde oxidation occurred. You can see the solid material on the, the top of the bottle. Um, so how much occurred? You don't know. Um, what if it was like 50% benzaldehyde and our yield was absolutely terrible or didn't even like proceed because whatever. Um, the benzaldehyde or benzoic acid kind of maybe reacted with our base and just kind of sequestered, like used up all of the reagents and the reaction just doesn't work. So as a possibility, you might want to purify your benzaldehyde. And how will we do this? Well, you can do a liquid-liquid extraction. I want you to think about why we would do this. Um, so we're trying to separate benzaldehyde from benzoic acid, right? And what you use is um, you put all of this benzoic acid or benzaldehyde in 
a mixture of about 5% sodium bicarbonate, okay? And generally you use a separatory funnel, but you can, let me show you a separatory funnel. No, we don't have one in the lab. So basically you mix your organic with your water, right? Uh, your 5% sodium bicarbonate and um, you shake it up, you get two layers, right? You'll get an emulsion because that's why would we make this extraction very easy. Um, and so after that separation occurs, you can separate the, the aqueous solution from the organic benzaldehyde solution and then you dry on calcium chloride, okay? Overnight. Um, and then you should have, in theory, um, pure benzaldehyde and that's sufficient to, for this experiment. I used a fresh bottle, so I didn't do that procedure. But I want you to think about why, what, how does that work? How does that process work? Okay, so benzaldehyde with water that is a, an aqueous solution of 5% sodium bicarbonate. How does that separate out the benzoic acid? Okay, so now let's take a look at the mass of our solution. Okay, so what we're gonna do is go ahead and zero that out. Take this guy. Ooh, it's a gorgeous yellow. It's a gorgeous day out, you know. Great day to look at the gorgeousness from the inside. So, whoa, 82.749 grams. Write it down. All right, then. 82 point something. I already forgot it. But we're going to put in our ooh, nine mils ish. Okay, it's all good. We're going to measure out how much we get in there. Going to the tippity, tippity top, y'all. Oh, I love that. You see those like swirling lines? That's dope. Oof. I should slow mo that for you guys. Oh, there was a. So now let's measure how much we've got. So, of course, your before and after is your mass of benzaldehyde, right? So it's almost, it's about 10 grams. So record that exact mass. We've got 92.236 grams for the final measurement of that mass, mass, the mass of that solution, okay? So now what we wanna do is we wanna let this guy chill for a couple days, okay? Uh, still watching it. I love staring at it. Whoa, look at it. Drip, drip, bloop, bloop. When I drip, you drip, we drip. You put your bends up in your flask. No, that doesn't work. I'm sorry. That was bad. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and cover this up. And then we'll, uh, I'll probably give it a little stirry stir. And then we'll hide it in the dark. Okay. So as you can see, I put a little foil on it, put it in a safe place, and of course, the, the darkest thing in the lab is a closed drawer. Also, my soul and my heart. I'm just kidding. I'm a nice person. Um, we're gonna leave, leave it there for a couple days, um, and hopefully, we should have some solid material, which would they would actually be gorgeous crystals of crude benzoin which we can then work up isolate and then determine how much we end up with okay okay so here's the thing um there's i said there's two different ways to do this right so the other way sorry 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 sorry, 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 sorry. so the other way is basically to heat it uh for 90 minutes at reflux so you still add all that stuff together and then you mix it you take really careful steps and not heating the reaction too much because thiamine hydrochloride will thermally decompose and then you heat it up to make the reaction proceed so traditionally in my experience the yield on that is garbage it's like 50 percent at maybe even like that's like great right it's usually like maybe like 30 percent um, and so like that's terrible, right? 
you put 20 mils of benzaldehyde in there and you can maybe get seven grams of stuff, right? Um, and that's good, right? So um, this way, I'm done. Like, I don't have to hang around for 90 minutes. I can just leave, come back the next day or two. So that's the only thing is like, technically it takes longer, right? But if you, if you plan ahead, you can mix that stuff together in a previous lab and then boom, come back and you're like, what's up? Got my products. We'll see how it goes. And then you can decide which method is better. Because technically we would be able to, after a 90 minute reflux, we allow it to cool. And then as it cools to room temperature, it would uh, start to crystallize, okay? Now, the thing about both of these reactions is that when I come back and look at that one in the dark drawer, or the reaction that I refluxed, if you did those two methods, one of them, or both of them can actually yield an oil. And so an oil, the way we can kind of overcome that, and if we are, if we are refluxing it, is heat it back up till it becomes a homogeneous solution, and then slowly cool it, okay? So if you can't, let's say it's a really cold room, for example, uh, and you want it to cool down very slowly. It is water and ethanol, right? So the heat capacity of that is pretty good and it won't cool super fast, but if you wanted to slow it down because the ambient temperature is actually pretty cold, what you can do is put that inside of a warm water bath and then let the warm water bath and that flask inside of it cool together because it's gonna take longer, right? It's gonna cool more slowly. Um, and the amount of water that you put it in could be greater, so that cooling process will take longer. Um, so that's just another tip for you guys. If you want to cool something more slowly, put it inside of like a hot water bath and then let that whole hot water bath and reaction cool to room temperature. And it makes for better crystals, okay? So remember, I always talk about crystallization. Uh, you want to, of course, use the minimum amount of hot solvent to dissolve it and then let it slowly cool. And the slower the process, the better. Uh, and so that's one way to make better crystals. If it occurs for this one, um, really, I've never seen it happen. So I probably wouldn't heat it. I might scratch it, agitate it, just kind of mess around with it. Um, but... Uh, let's see, was there anything else that I wanted to say? Nope. Nope, not at all. So that's pretty much it for now. Um, you're gonna take a look at the final product. What we're gonna do is isolate it, filter it, um, maybe wash it, uh, get the melting points, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Since it's a slow crystallization process, we're not going to do a recrystallization process. That's kind of silly, right? So, um, yeah, sweet.